All right, thank you all for joining me today. I am your man, Corp J. And I want to say thank you all for joining me today. I have a great conversation for you all, a conversation that I think is worth having. And we're talking about why African Americans are now leaving Ghana in droves back to the United States. And it's a trend that has been happening in the last two years and has really maintained a pace since then. And in recent time, uh, people were talking about this and uh, I, wanna, I wanna have this conversation because I think that this is a teachable moment. It's something that I think we can learn from because I am gonna tell you why they're coming back. I am gonna tell you also uh, the challenges that they met in Ghana and have since met in Ghana since they uh, answered the call in 2019. And I'm going to, more importantly, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, the Ghanaian president, the current president, Nana Akofo Addo, made that call in 2019. So let's get right into it because I want to I get into this conversation. So as I mentioned early on, uh, the present Ghanaian president, Nana Akofo Addo made a call in 2019, um, which he called the Year of Return. Uh, this was to commemorate 400 years of the, uh, the transatlantic sl uh, slavery. And it was to call home um, black people in the diaspora whose ancestors were taken from Africa 400 years ago. And, and that was the whole point of it. Now, I'm going to tell you also later on in this video why Nigeria did not make that call. I think it's important for African Americans to understand why Nigerians didn't make that call. I think you're going to find the reason why. Because Nigeria was the one country where 80% of the slaves were taken from. 80% of the slaves that made it through the uh, Atlantic Ocean, they were all sent to either Jamaica, to England, or to the Americas, United States in particular. 80% of those slaves came from Nigeria. But I'm going to tell you why Nigeria didn't make that call. And also why the call by the Ghanaian president was an economic strategy, had nothing to do with the PR that it got. It was for an economic boost to Ghana. Okay, so let's, let's, let's go into it. So Ghana has been experiencing some challenges over the years. It's no secret that the economy of Ghana is on life support. It has been for a while. As recent as even last year, Ghana's president went to the IMF to borrow money again, uh, which they were just approved of that. Ghana has defaulted on its loan. Ghana's economy is in bad shape. Ghana, amongst a couple of other African countries, are on the brink of civil unrest. Uh, they are actually at the brink of bankruptcy. It is pretty bad in Ghana. And I know that what we've mostly heard is a romanticizing of the economy of Ghana, but the situation is bad. I want you to take a listen to uh, this interview at BBC with Ghanaian, uh, the, the current Ga uh, Ghanaian president with a BBC reporter. And I want you to take a look at this very testy exchange. But if I look at the Ghanaian economy at the moment, you know, it's doing... I mean, let's just be honest, it's doing terribly. Uh, oh, not terribly. Well, um, it's just, it's, when, uh, when you, uh, your, your inflation in your country, inflation in Ghana. I don't know the economy in the world that's doing well. well Tell me, Ghana, where you are Ghana, here. Inflation in Ghana. <laughs> the highest well, inflation. Well, 15.7%. Uh, the the, the Ghanaian said he has fallen 20% on the dollar. The worst, the worst after Russia, which, is, which has a lot of sanctions against it. It's began, it's began to, to firm up. 
it has begun to firm up and we're, we're, we're seeing the, the CD systematically appreciating against the dollar. People still can't employ, you know, I was just reading today, you know, um, people in the hospitality industry that you're pushing so hard, you know, having to lay their staff off. We've got taxi driver unions threatening strikes because of spiraling fuel costs. I mean, it, it doesn't look like a place that I want to go and put my money. Okay, so that's, that's the reality of where Ghana's economy is. That interview was done last year. And prior to that, their economy has really been in bad shape, which is why uh, Nana Akofo Ado wanted to do something uh, that didn't involve borrowing money because they're, they borrowed more than they can borrow. And he needed to inject capital into the Ghanaian economy without a loan, without having it come from a loan. So the initiative, the year of the return, while very clever and very strategic, was primarily, and it was the goal for that, was a economic boost to the Ghanaian economy. He needed to find money or way for money to come into the country without it coming from either a loan from China or a loan from the IMF because he's maxed out already on these and the interest rates on those are really bogging down the economy. And so he and his cabinet members came up with a clever idea because, uh, and which w has since been coined the year of the return, which now has morphed into what's called um, the, um, what, what, the, what they call it right now. Um, it was called the year of the return, and it's now called beyond the return. Okay. Now, here is why uh, that was doomed to fail from the beginning. The reason why that strategy, when I heard it in 2019, and when I saw the attention that it got, and all of these African Americans on the internet, which were paid, some of them were paid to sponsor, to talk about it, they were paid by the Ghanaian government to talk about this in the airwave. The reason why that was doomed to fail from the start was because there was no way that that was going to inject capital to Ghanaian's economy the way they were hoping. Here's what I mean by that. There are three types of status of African Americans that heard that. We're going to deal with the ones here in this country because that was a call made to Africans in the diaspora. So British blacks who were whose ancestors were taken to England heard that call as well as African Americans. So I'm going to deal with it here as it relates to African Americans, which is what this title is about. Here are three types, three status of African Americans that heard that call. One of which answered the call. The first class or status of African Americans are your job creators. These are your celebrities, Oprah Winfrey, Steve Harvey, uh, Dave Chappelle, Jay-Z, Beyonce, Nicki Minaj, your celebrities. And in that also, you had uh, business owners that uh, heard that call. Now, these individuals went to Ghana. They went to visit Ghana. We saw them. We saw publicity. We saw pictures. However, these individuals within this status were never going to move to Ghana, okay? Because these are your job creators. The idea of having these individuals with deep pockets, with job, these are job creators in the United States with that influence and resources, moving their resources from the United States to Ghana was never going to happen. That was never going to happen, okay? And these were perhaps the type of people that he was hoping to pull into Ghana, but there was no way. With the tax bracket that Oprah Winfrey is getting in the United States, with the tax bracket that a lot of these business owners, the job creators, the small percentage of African Americans who are, who are creating jobs in the country, they were not going to move to Ghana. So that exempts those people. That's, that's by the way. And then the second status are your working class individuals, the ones with jobs, the ones with either an eight to five, you know, nine to six, whatever. These ones that have jobs. 
the, the ones that either make hourly wage or make salary anywhere from either forty thousand dollars a year 50 60 80 90 100 whatever your active work workforce that are african americans weren't going to move okay because essentially what would happen is they have to quit the job and they have to move to a different country and the idea of quitting a job that you've made a livelihood livelihood with you have built your home uh that wasn't going to happen so these ones did not move okay so now you have these two heavy hitters the job creators and the um the workers your your your, your workforce that wasn't going to happen now leaves you on the third p the third start status the ones that really did make the move these were your unemployed african americans the ones that have already dropped off the the uh, labor market they weren't actively working in the labor market and what i mean dropped off the labor markets these weren't your w-2s and they were not your 1099s okay when i mean 1099s i'm talking about those who are 1099s with a brick and mortar store in the united states they weren't going to move okay i'm talking about these ones were your your influencers basically your social media sensation your social media influencers who get prime their primary source of income from either youtube instagram however that's it's a small market and these are the ones that answer the call to ghana the number that had that has since been reported of these particular pocket of individuals that made that call the number that's floating around is a total of about 1500 of those that have since made the way to ghana but half of those have returned and have since returned back to the united states and many also are following suit here is why they are coming back and i'm going to deal with that pocket of individuals i told you about that are the ones that have dropped off the ones that dropped off the job market your unemployed individuals who are solely dependent on their online um, ventures okay so these are the ones that are that made their way to ghana now here are the challenges that these individuals found while when they got to ghana first the cost of living the cost of living in a different country never mind ghana uh, when you move with very limited resources, as these particular ones have done, isn't going to sustain you month over month, year after year in a country when you don't have a steady stream of income. When I mean a steady stream of income, I'm talking about a W-2 coming through. If you move to a different country and the idea that you're going to move to a country and start a business, which is the rhetoric you're hearing from a lot of these people, especially on the Internet, is ridiculous and ludicrous. Any serious-minded person moving to a different country will need to have a steady stream of income to be to sustain in that country to have incomes that are variable and which is what the income they were making from whatever venture online it's a variable income that means it's not a steady monthly income that you were going to know at the end of the month this is what i'm going to bring in every month it's variable so it's based on how well either your videos did on on youtube or your 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 instagram page or whatever other online venture that was those are variable income they're not fixed okay now when they got to ghana they undoubtedly found that the cost of living in ghana was very high especially in accra was very very high but not not only that even those that lived in other cities in ghana realized quickly that when they pay for rent, when pay for electricity, when they pay for trash, for uh, uh, for transportation, for food, you know the everyday items we pay for, quickly ate ate through their their limited funds that they were having in Ghana, and they quickly found that they weren't bringing in enough money from whatever the online ventures to really sustain economically that. So that was a problem for these individuals there. It was something that was perhaps the reality of that was not sold to them when they plugged in and listened to a lot of these people online talking about move to Africa, move to Ghana. Ghana is such a great place, it's a haven. 
the reality of that was not explained to them and they quickly met you know that reality and it really became something that was a problem which is why a lot of them moved back to the united states because they found that their the cost of living in ghana outweigh what they were actually living on in the united states so that's one second part of it is the cultural differences a lot of the individuals that went to Ghana from the United States quickly found there was a cultural clash between themselves and the locals in Ghana. There is a huge, uh, there is a huge gap in terms of language. Most of us from Africa, we all speak the broken English, which is how we communicate, right? Like when I go home, I don't speak how I'm speaking right now. I straight up broken English, and that's how I communicate. Love it. I can understand it. I can, I can relate to it because I was born into the system. That was a problem already. So communication was a barrier for a lot of them, as well as understanding the, how the locals in Ghana operate. What I mean by that is, for example, if I or many others from Africa go to Africa, like when I go to visit my family over there and I need something done, like a service done, and I call a guy and I say, hey, I need you to come and fix my, my dad's AC, right? It's having problems. It's like, yo, I'll be there. I'll be there. I'll be there. And he tells me he'll be there in an hour. I know that an hour is not an hour, right? I mean, most of us in Africa, we know this. If he says in an hour, I'm not sitting at home waiting for this guy an hour to, for him to show up. I'm going to go do other things because I know he's not going to come in that hour, within that hour. He's going to show up four hours later. He's going to show up six hours later and perhaps the next day. And it's not a problem because we know it's just the way it is. For someone who isn't used to that, and they're used to a system in the United States where you call for a service man to come and fix your AC or maintenance or whatever, and he says he'll be there at 9 a.m. in the morning, he'll show up at 9 a.m. in the morning because that's a system. And if he shows up at five minutes late, he's apologizing for this. You're not going to get that over there, right? And that's just, a, that's just one aspect of it. So the cultural differences to me was one that was the reality of that really hit. A lot of them, especially also when you go and you want to complain and you want customer service. Here in the United States, we have customer service. You can ask for a manager. I want let me speak to your manager. Manager show up, shows up and you say, hey, this person is your employee here in the United States. Your employee is acting up. And the manager will apologize. <laughs> you know, I'm so sorry. I apologize. Hey, perhaps give you the food for free, whatever. You go over there. You're not getting that. <laughs> you're not getting that, right? They're more likely to tell you to get lost. And what, what, what are you doing? So that's, that's, that's a cultural difference. It's not, a, it's not good or bad. It's just the way it is in that country. In addition to a lot of things, infrastructure problem, you know, the inconsistencies with transportation, lighting problem. You show up in your house and you turn on the light. There's no light. There's no electricity. That is a problem. Those are everyday living. Okay? That is sure to drive anyone who's not used to that system nuts and say, I, I can't do it. There's only so much I can take. I have to go back to where at least I know certain things that work. They're, they're predictable. I understand how much I'm making every month. I understand what I'm paying for this, for that. I can budget and I can deal with the system because that's how I grew. That's what I grew into. So that's another problem. The last problem and the third one, which I think in addition to these two that I've mentioned, is one word, taxes. Taxes is something that I'm not sure if the president of Ghana considered this in addition to all the other things. I don't know if he considered all of that when he made that call and or perhaps promoted that whole idea that if you come to Ghana, it's just haven. Because every United States passport holder, every U.S. citizen, has an obligation by law as a condition of your citizenship, whether you're born in the country or whether you're naturalized in the country, as a condition of your citizenship by law, you must pay taxes to the U.S. Treasury. If you earn money in the country or you earn money outside of the country, you must pay taxes to the United States Treasury. It's a condition of your citizenship. There's no one that's above taxes. No one is above the law. So the individuals over there, as I mentioned, most of which are 
your 1099 employees. What I mean by 1099, if you're not getting a W-2, W-2s are what the your employer uh, sends to you at the end of your your pay cycle. It essentially has a breakdown of how much you're making per year, per month, per weekly, and also has all the deductions taken out of it. So they will take out all your taxes. They take out your Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security tax. They'll take all your tax, city tax, states, federal, if you depend on the state you're in. And then they hand you what you what's left afterward, your net. Your net is all breaking down your W-2. That's what you file at the end of the year. Of the of the uh, of the year for next year so those are w-2 that says that you make this much every month and most of us plan around that so we know how much we're making every month we can plan on our lifestyle around that your 1099s however are what's given to businesses so they don't tax that okay those are not taxed because the irs understands if you own a business there's certain costs that you're going to incur you know, which which is gonna vary from one business to another. However, at the end of your at the end of the, the tax year, you're expected to pay taxes on whatever earns or gains you've made. And if you have losses that you didn't make any money, you can file what's called a schedule C, which allows you to deduct whatever cost, operating costs you had to incur while operating the business. And you can file a loss. Right, and if you make gains, you have to pay taxes on those gains. So he, those are the two documents that are sent to these, to these, to anyone making money in the United States who is who has the right to work in the country or anyone living outside of the country. As long as you are U.S. pass, you are a U.S. citizen living outside the country, you must pay taxes. So for these individuals, think about it for a second. They're in Ghana, making money from YouTube. Instagram, however how little that is, because I can guarantee you it's not it's not that much, right? But let's just say they were making for those who made a significant amount of money from their from their venture online. Let's just say, you know, they're making good money from that. They have to pay taxes on that. Right? Now, these ones are not eligible for deduction. They can't file Schedule C. Because Schedule C's basically, as I mentioned, are deductions that you incurred. Where your business is operating, and if you're outside the United States, that's not going to that's you're, you're not eligible for filing Schedule C for that. Your Schedule C will be filed in the United States, so you're not going to be eligible for that. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> so you're gonna have to pay the full taxes on this because no, no, the, the IRS is not going to accept that you incurred expenses driving, you know, the Mo Luel, the downfall, or whatever they, they're driving Ghana. You know, and you want to deduct the mileage on that. It's not going to work, okay? It's going to have to be operations in the United States, right? That's that's how that is. So they're not going to be deduct that. So they're going to have to pay whatever percentage on taxes that it is for that. So imagine paying that percentage of tax to the United States Treasury. And imagine paying the taxes in Ghana, because you have to pay taxes in Ghana. That is steep on whatever monthly income you're making in addition to the cost of living that you're going to that you that you're faced with every month. So, <laughs> I would like to think that these individuals are paying the taxes. I would like to think that. However, that is going to be a steep deep it's going to dip into your monthly cost and that's going to eat out whatever you're bringing in. It's it's bad enough that you're paying the taxes you're paying in the U.S., which can go from anywhere from 20 some to 24% if you're married, or as high as 33% if you're a single person. Okay? It's bad enough that many of us pay this, and we look forward to uh, our tax return every year, first of the year, so we can claim some of that money back. Right? You're not going to be eligible. These individuals are not eligible for that. And so that is a huge cost liability. And to not pay your taxes in the United States is to, it, it's a federal offense. It's a federal offense that many have gone to jail for. And the IRS now is cracking down on many people who are uh, 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 avoiding taxes, tax avoidance, which is why the Biden administration, the current administration uh, here in the United States, 
increased and expand the audit department for the IRS a couple of years ago. And one of the initiatives behind that was to go after those who defrauded the United States government of COVID relief funds. That's one. But the audit department is the audit department. They're going after anyone who is not paying the taxes. And they know the names of everyone because <laughs> YouTube and every other company has to send to the IRS how much they paid every individual, especially if they paid you more than $500 during a pay period. If you earn more than $500 a year, you are going to get either a W-2, you're going to you're gonna have to pay taxes on that, or you get a 1099, right? And so they know the names, the Social Security, and the identity of everyone who is supposed to be paying taxes. They know how much you made, and you got to pay taxes on that. So how are you able to pay taxes? To the United States Treasury, living in a different country as a U.S. citizen, and then pay taxes in Ghana. Okay, so so that's that's something that wasn't uh, that's something that's is a huge burden because I can guarantee you one of these countries' tax men are not are not getting their money. <laughs> one of these countries, <laughs> the tax man from one of these countries isn't getting the money. <laughs> okay, and and it's probably more likely going to be Ghana. <laughs> it's more likely that these individuals were not paying taxes into Ghana, which would have injected capital into the country. All right. So so with these challenges, we're seeing them coming home, which is why I said that the initiative was DOA from the jump. It was fail, it was bound to fail from the from the jump. Not to mention that in along along the lines of the uh, cultural clashes, many of the African Americans that went over there went with a European mindset. And they weren't received by the locals in Ghana. So there was this clash going on. The, the locals were very suspicious of who they are. These ones went over there with a colonial mindset, were better than you. So they didn't really get along in Ghana. Forget the romanticizing thing that's going on online right now. Forget all of that. This, the reality of what was going on is that there was a clash between these two. And, and which also was a huge problem because it caused them to miss their home, it, it caused them to uh, uh, not go further in, in with, with what they would have been doing over there. And it just was a big problem for the ones that answered the call who had very limited resources, very, very limited resources. And that resources was quickly deplenished while they were there in Ghana. And the Ghanaian locals were not very welcoming Forget what you're hearing. They were not very welcoming to these foreigners who were now in their land, eating of their resources and not contributing, which is essentially what happened. So now you have these 1,500 people, who half of them have come back, who did little to nothing to, contributing, to contribute to the economy of Ghana in terms of tax injection, paying taxes or any other way. Whatever they contributed was minuscule. Didn't really, t didn't really uh, tip the scale because of the status of individuals that I told you came to Ghana. These were not your job creators. These were not your business owners in terms of real deep pocket individuals. So whatever they were coming in, it was not enough to really tip the scale. And so most of them really fed off and lived off the resources of the locals. And that is why the current president, Nana Akofuado, is not popular right now. There is a, there's a call to have him ousted. There's a call for him to resign. There are a lot of civil unrest because the intention and the goal behind that campaign failed. And what that campaign has done was burden the economy of Ghana with the new, new visitors that visited the country, which added little to nothing to the economy. Now, I want to talk to you about why Nigeria didn't make that call. And I'm going to close this quickly. See, Nigeria, whose economy has, is the opposite of Ghana. Nigeria's economy has been experiencing growth. Nigeria's GDP uh, grew by 3.25 uh, last year. And Nigeria's economy has been, uh, based on the current factor, has really been moving in an upward trajectory. 
Nigeria, like Ghana, has also gone to borrow money. Every country has borrowed money in Africa. However, borrowing money is not a problem because even the United States borrows money. Okay, the United States is in debt to China. Borrow money is not the problem. It is can you service your debt? That is the issue. And Ghana has defaulted, has not been able to service its debt. Nigeria has never defaulted on its loan. There are articles that are out there that Nigeria has never defaulted. And here's why. Nigeria's economy, with all of the rhetoric that you hear about the poverty rate in Nigeria and all of that, with all of that rhetoric, Nigeria is not defaulted on its, uh, on its debt, and Nigeria's GDP seems to trend upwards and not downwards. Nigeria is not at risk of, of, of economic bankruptcy, even while Nigeria's debt is growing year after year. So its debt is growing. However, they are able to service those debts, right? Now, here's why. From the moment Nigeria gained its independence in 1960, and from the moment Nigeria discovered oil in 1958, Nigeria's mindset and their policy has always been to invite businesses to the country. Nigeria over the years has really created an atmosphere that's really invited business mindset people to the country. When I mean business mindset people, I'm talking about individuals that we know for a fact that when you see them anywhere, these are job creators. See, there are five types of individuals that are, five, are job creators, five types of individuals from different races that are job creators. Anywhere you see these individuals, you know they have shops somewhere. You know they have a store somewhere. These individuals are white people. Okay, Anywhere white people are, these are job creators. Chinese people, okay, we all know them. These are job creators, okay? They're, they're just anywhere you see Chinese folks. These guys have a, a restaurant somewhere. They have a store somewhere. Nigerians are job creators, which is why when you go to Nigeria, 85 to 80, almost 90% of all the resources in Nigeria are owned by Nigerians, okay? Anywhere you see Nigerians in all over the world, these people have restaurants all over the place. They're business owners. They, even when they go to school, they're trans, they, they translating that into a business. Nigerians are known for entrepreneurship. These are job creators. And then you have Koreans. Koreans are also job creators. They own stores, weak stores. Nonetheless, these are not consumers alone. They are job creators. And then last but not least, Indians. Okay, These five individuals, you can't argue that any way you find them, these ones are creating jobs, which is why when you go to Nigeria, you find the presence of these individuals in Nigeria. Nigeria uh, in, intentionally goes after businesses. Nigeria things like Texas. I think, let me tell you about Texas for a second. Texas of all the 50 states, 50 states in the United States, if you don't count Hawaii, of all the 50 states in the United States, Texas is a business mindset state, which is why Texas is the only state in the United States with a $5 billion rainy day fund. There's no other state in the United States with a $5 billion reserve rainy day funds. They're just sitting there in the bank account untouched. Texas has a $5 billion rainy day fund. Texas is never going to go bankrupt anytime soon because when Texas discovered oil, Texas caters to businesses. In Texas, if you sue a business in Texas, you better have a strong case because you're likely, you're more than likely going to lose that case because Texas caters to businesses, which is why the state has thrived. The cost of living in this state is very low compared to other states. Many people are moving to Texas because their policy and their mindset from the moment they discover oil is always to cater and to create an avenue for businesses to come in because when businesses come in, people are going to come in. And you can then lower the cost and be able to compete on a, on a global scale. That is the strategy that Nigeria used. It took me a while to understand this. And Nigeria is not perfect. It's getting there. It's still a young country. But the mindset from what I've studied and what I've watched this country over the years is that they invite business create job creators to that country, which is why there's a huge population of Chinese in Nigeria. This one is not there consuming Nigerian resources. They're creating jobs in Nigeria. Restaurants building things, they are creating jobs, which Nigerians work in those areas. Indians, hospitality industry is damn well owned by a lot of Indians. You go to any hotels, it's owned by Indians. And they're, as well as Lebanese, 
or in Nigeria creating job. And more importantly, the most job the most job creators in Nigeria are Nigerians. The Nigerians are the, the, the ones with the most resources in, in this, no matter how these immigrants are in Nigeria. Nigerians own 80 to 90 percent of the resources in that country. Which is why Nigeria and South Africa would never be the same. You see, in South Africa, you have the white people over there that own the small percentage of white folks own 80% of the, of the resources in, in South Africa. That's never going to happen in Nigeria because 85 to even 90% of Nigerians own all the resources in Nigeria. But Nigeria, the point I'm, what I'm trying to make here is that Nigeria has created a, in an environment that attracts these people in. And that's why Nigeria did not reach out to African Americans because African Americans are not known for their entrepreneurial background. That's not what African African Americans are consumers at best. They are mostly consumers. They're not known for creating jobs. You have a few percentage, very tiny, but the overwhelming of them are more consumer based than they are job creators. That's 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 African Americans. And there's nothing wrong with that because in the world that we live in, we have job creators and we have consumers. Consumers want job creators and job creators want consumers. So these two, it's, it's a perfect marriage. Okay, so, so that's why Nigeria didn't make that bold call. But nonetheless, African Americans eventually are going to make their way to Nigeria because what's happening, what's going to happen eventually is because Nigeria invites business over, which is why Google is over there. IBM is over there. You have a lot of companies, deep pocket companies, setting up shop over there. What's eventually going to happen is that they're going to start hiring Americans. They're going to start hiring Americans because I mentioned it in my past videos, low cost, low, um, low cost uh, labor. And that's what's going to eventually make a lot of people from the diaspora, people, whether they're African-Americans or Nigerians or Ghanaians, wherever they are living in death, they're going to make their way to Nigeria because they'll be able to work in those U.S.-based companies, get their feet going, and then be able to establish themselves where then they can then build businesses. That's how you move people in. You get that. So, so, so I wanted to cover this because, you know, that was a missed opportunity with Ghana. Ghana missed the mark on that. With that call, it burdened its economy. We're seeing that that's initiative based on the goal of it, which was an economically based initiative, has failed. But in terms of the PR that it got, that was perfect. It got a huge PR coverage and all of that. But that didn't translate into an injection of capital into the country. Anyway, thank you all for watching. Please uh, give this video a, a, video a thumbs up. Um, let me know what your thoughts are. Subscribe to the channel, and I will see you all. Next time. Put them high yardies, yardies Don't be lue bad, dra ner oss Men du är fett och vanlig På det jag lägger all min tid upp Jag vill ha det, ha det Du får mig tjäna safety Det kan nog leda 